Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford, and over the years I've gotten a lot of sharp questions about Old Norse manuscripts, and especially since I began teaching my Old Norse class on Zoom, where students are very interested in what's actually there on the page in our manuscripts. Now, I have a long video from a few years ago about how to read Old Norse manuscripts, but I thought for people who don't want to take as deep of a dive, but just want kind of a quick uh, intro orientation to it, I would make a video looking at some stanzas on one page of the Codex Regis, the Portic Edda. This is page 9v, 9 verso. That's roughly equivalent to what we would call page 18, because what we do is we talk about each leaf. Right, physical page of the manuscript is the number, and then it has a recto side, the front side, and a verso side, the back side. So 9v is the back side of leaf 9, so roughly equivalent to what we'd call 18. I say roughly because sometimes there's blank pages or whatever too. Um, so this contains some stanzas from Grimnismal, including uh, a favorite stanza, memorized stanza about uh, Hugin and Munin, which is their most prominent mention in uh, Norse myth. It's Odin talking about different realms and different beings in those realms, including his ravens. So um, let's take a look at this page. I'll actually switch over to try and record this on Zoom so that I can look at the manuscript live. Uh, and uh, hopefully you'll have clear audio. I mean, that always seems to be a problem with me, but it won't be outdoor audio. You won't have the beautiful background though. Um, hopefully my goddamn neighbor isn't moaning at the time. So again, this is just an intro video. If you're interested in this subject and you want a lot more about reading Old Norse manuscripts, look for an older, longer video on this channel. So let's pull up Codex Regis, page 9v. And I'm just going to give you a real quick overview of some major characteristics of Old Norse manuscript writing in the period when most of our really important manuscripts for Old Norse are from the 1200s, 1300s. This is the hand that is handwriting style font, essentially, called uh, Carolingian minuscule. So it shares features both with the insular style of medieval Ireland and England and the Carolingian style, the style pioneered at Charlemagne's court. So if we look at one of my very favorite stanzas, just because I like ravens, right? The one about Hugin Oak Moonin. Notice here we have that double N that's spelling a excuse me, that, that capital N, and that's actually spelling a double N. So an economical way that you can save some space in a manuscript is to just write uh, any letter that's doubled as uh, a capital. And that's what you're seeing right there. Another thing you'll see here is the Tyronian Nota. That's this almost stylized seven looking thing. It's, I mean, it looks different in different instances in different hands, but uh, you know, people say it looks kind of like a seven, and I think that's about right. But that means and in whatever language the writing is in. So in Latin, it means et, and in Old Norse, it means oak. Notice that Old Norse writers, like most medieval writers, don't distinguish between I and J on the one hand and between U and B on the other. So in this word, fuga, in a standardized text, what you're going to see uh, instead of F-L-I-B-G-A is F-L-J-U-G-A, Fluga. So they're not going to distinguish I from J, they're not going to distinguish U from B. 
Another of the most common symbols that we see in Carolingian insular writing is this little thing. Almost looks like a comma or a lightning strike put above another letter. Let's see if there's another one right in here. There is, there's this if here, which has the tittle over the F. Yeah, that is uh, standing for ER or IR. So anytime that you see that, add ER or IR after whatever letter it's over. So this is H-V-I-A-N, but with the tittle above the V, that means this is Huerian, H-V-E-R-J-A-N. Let me see if I can figure out a way to type this to make some... Yeah, there we go, Huerian. And then this, Y-F, with the tittle over the F, that means here, right? So the tittle stands for an ER or an IR that's left out after the letter that it's positioned over. Another thing to note is R rotunda. This is when the letter R is written uh, without its stave, the vertical staff on the left. Instead, the letter that precedes the R is treated as its vertical stave. So here you have an R rotunda that's taking off from an O. The O is being used as the stave of the R. See the R shape here? That is R rotunda. Something to watch for because it can make you think that you're looking at like one letter or sometimes an OE ligature, which is not what that is. It's an R. Also note in this same word, in most editions, you're going to see this written as one word, Jormun Grund. So Jormun meaning uh, enormous or whole, right? And you also note the name of the monster Jormun Gander. This is Jormun Grund, like the whole earth. Um, Modern Icelandic writes this as one word as a compound Yodemun Grun. If I mean if they write it at all, it's reference to this, but they would write it as one word. Um in Old Norse compounds very, very often are just written as separate words. Um actually the way that English writes compound words. So you have to watch for that. Note that uh, typically it is a decision of the editor to write that as one word, because often editors, I'll include myself in this, are influenced by modern Icelandic stylings. Notice also um, another thing that's di different in editions that in actual manuscripts is actual manuscripts use a lot of the letter C. So this is ek, right? I, which in any standardized text you're going to see is EK. Now you see the spelling EK too, but EC is extremely common. They use C all the time instead of K, and that's something that you wouldn't get from uh, standardized manuscript, standardized text in a uh, printed edition. Also notice they do make mistakes and they try to write them as small as possible, just like we do. So there's a word of that was missing here that the scribe has written in uh, real small above the egg. That means it goes after the egg. Several really common words are going to be abbreviated in predictable ways. This is han, he, him. That's an H with this extra flare coming off to the right. Almost could look like a, like a tittle. Notice up here, you've got the tittle over the V, right? That means the ER or IR is missing. This is a little bit more like the swoop of a letter, like a thorn or something. It's being attached to the bar of the H, but that means he. And then another very, very common feature is this long line, this macron, like right here. When that comes over a vowel, that means that an M or an N is being left out after that. So this is komi, the, um, the subjunctive form of the third person present singular, come, comes, so komi. And then in most editions, you're actually going to see this written not C-O-I thorn, but K-O-M-I-T. And that's because this thorn is representing the negative suffix T that is so common in Old Norse poetry. Um, any manuscript from the 1200s or later is late enough that some T's and unstressed syllables are becoming uh, ev. Now, they are actually inconsistent in Old Norse about writing the voice versus the unvoiced TH sound, thorn and ev. So um, this is actually on its way toward being modern Icelandic, although Icelandic 
today is going to lose this negative suffix t if this were the past participle, which looks the same way, having having come, um, that will become comid in modern Icelandic. And that's what you're seeing, kind of a first step toward already in this manuscript from about 1270. Come back in a sec after giving you a quick word from my friends and partners at Grand Frost. All right, folks. Well, I hope that was a uh, somewhat enjoyable or informative, or both even, look at uh, that page from Grimnes Mall in the Codex Regis of the Poetic Edda. Um, the longer video about uh, reading manuscripts is, is still up. Please do check that out. Uh, I'm going to show you an image on the screen. It's on an active link. Thank you, Patreon, Ko-Fi, all you folks out there supporting the channel. Thank you to those taking my Old Norse class on Zoom, soon to be offered in a second semester starting in late May, uh, both a beginning class and an advanced reading class. And thank you to those buying my books and to those coming to the monthly talks at Mead Krieger in Loveland, Colorado. Thanks to all, and for now, from the shores of the Big Thompson in beautiful Colorado, I'm wishing you all the best. <laughs>